So hello, everyone, and welcome. I have a friend who's an artist and he's sometimes taken a view which I don't agree with very well. You hold up a flower and say, look how beautiful it is. And I'll agree, I think. And he says, you see, as I as an artist can see how beautiful this is. But you as a scientist, oh, take this all apart and it becomes a dull thing. And I think that he's kind of nutty. First of all, the beauty that he sees is available to other people and to me too. I believe, although I may not be quite as refined as aesthetically as he is, that I can appreciate the beauty of a flower. At the same time, I see much more about the flower than he sees. I could imagine the cells in there, the complicated actions inside, which also have a beauty. I mean, it's not just beauty at this dimension of one centimeter. There's also beauty at a smaller dimension. The inner structure, also the processes, the fact that the colors and the flower are evolved in order to attract insects to pollinate it is interesting. It means that insects can see the color. It adds a question. Does this aesthetic sense also exist in the lower forms? That are, does it, why is it aesthetic? All kinds of interesting questions which the science knowledge only adds to the excitement, the mystery, and the awe of a flower. It only adds. I don't understand how it subtracts. If you expected science to give all the answers to the wonderful questions about what we are, where we're going, what the meaning of the universe is, and so on, then I think you could easily become the solution and then look for some mystic answer to these problems. How a scientist can take a mystic answer, I don't know, because the whole spirit is to understand well, never mind that. Any, I don't understand that. But anyhow, uh, if you think of it, though, I, the way I think of what we're doing is we're exploring. We're trying to find out as much as we can about the world. People say to me, are you looking for the ultimate uh, laws of physics? No, I'm not. I'm just looking to find out more about the world. And if it turns out there is a simple ultimate law that explains everything, so be it. That would be very nice to discover. If it turns out it's like an onion with millions of layers and we're just sick and tired of looking at the layers, then that's the way it is. But whatever way it comes out, its nature is there and she's going to come out the way she is. And therefore, when we go to investigate it, we shouldn't pre-decide what it is we're trying to do except to find out more about it. You see, one thing is I can live with doubt and uncertainty and not knowing. I think it's much more interesting to live not knowing than to have answers which might be wrong. I have approximate answers and possible beliefs and different degrees of certainty about different things, but I'm not absolutely sure of anything, and there are many things I don't know anything about. But I don't have to know an answer. I don't, have to, I don't feel frightened by not knowing things, by being lost in the mysterious universe without having any purpose, which is the way it really is, as far as I can tell, possibly. It doesn't frighten me. And so altogether, I can't believe the special stories that have been made up about our relationship to the universe at large because they seem to be too simple, too, too, too connected, too local, too provincial. The earth, he came to the earth. One of the aspects of God came to the earth, mind you. And look at what's out there. How can he, it isn't in proportion. Anyway, it's no use arguing. I can't argue it. I'm just trying to tell you, with the scientific view, or well, my father's view, that we should look to see what's true and what may, be, may not be true. Once you start doubting, which I think, to me, is a very fundamental part of my soul, is to doubt and to ask. When you doubt and ask, it gets a little harder to believe. That was nice, right? Um, it would uh, it would it would take uh, it would take uh, quite a lot of nerve to uh, to attempt to follow Richard Feynman. Um, so instead, let's make Walt Whitman do it. Uh, 
this is a poem called When I Heard the Learned Astronomer. When I heard the learned astronomer, when the proofs, the figures were ranged in columns before me, when I was shown the charts and diagrams to add, divide, and measure them, when I, sitting, heard the astronomer where he lectured with much applause in the lecture room, how soon unaccountable I became tired and sick, till rising and gliding out, I wandered off by myself in the mystical, moist night air, and from time to time looked up in perfect silence at the stars. So there we have a scientist and a poet, each in their own way, addressing the topic that I want to talk about today, which is these two different ways of looking at the world, like a scientist or like a poet, and the tension between them, and what games have to tell us about this tension, and what this tension has to tell us about games. So with apologies to Walt Whitman, let me range in columns before you some of the words we use to describe these two ways of looking at the world. Thought versus feeling, intellect versus emotion, rationality versus intuition. On the one side, the realm of science and logic, and on the other, art and morality, here the domain of reducing, explaining, measuring, and objective truth. And over here, the domain of the irreducible, the inexplicable, the immeasurable, and subjective truth. So whatever words you want to use, I think we can all recognize these two broad categories of human understanding. So the basic idea of this talk is that the relationship between these two categories is important, that it's worth talking and thinking about, that it's especially important now at this particular moment in human history, and that games have something valuable to contribute to this conversation. So one common way that this tension gets framed in recent discussions around games is, is like this. On the one hand, associated with the general ideas of logic and rationality, you have traditional, more structured games with explicit goals, a focus on competition, on winning and losing, and problem solving in general, a focus on systems and the idea of what some people call instrumental play. You know, imagine power gamers min-maxing, trying to find optimal solutions and that kind of thing. And then on the other hand, associated with the general ideas of feeling and emotion, you have less traditional games with less focus on structured goals and, and more focus on open-ended exploration, on setting, theme, and story, on the moment-to-moment -moment quality of the player's experience, and on improvisational and imaginative play. So this is the way that the tension is framed by, for example, people like Genova Chen when he talks about wanting to expand the palette of emotions uh, in games, expand their emotional range, or, or by people like David Cage when he talks about uh, emotion and meaning, um, or by scholars like Miguel Seacart who wants us to focus less on, on rules and on the procedural logics of game systems and pay more attention to the creative power of players. One of the, I think, most eloquent articulations of this way of framing games comes from the composer and musician and thinker David Kanega, who has written a lot of, of really interesting stuff about these ideas. Here's a quote uh, from David. Uh, Here's the massive tension. Games are both playful, irrational things and highly structural things. And integrating the reality of these apparently contradictory tendencies is maybe the most important, baffling work there is to do in design, theory, and play. Right now, the rational aspect of games is way overrepresented. So I agree with David that this is important work, and this is basically the work that I want to try to do here today. Uh, but I don't agree with the general approach that separates these different aspects into two categories, two different kinds of ingredients, the rational and the emotional, and talks about having less of one and more of the other. Uh, my approach to integrating these forces is totally different, and it starts with a close examination of what it feels like to play this game. Co-op. This is a game created by Bennett Foddy, a friend of mine and a colleague who teaches with me at the NYU Game Center. So what's it like to play co-op? Uh, well, to begin with, here's this thing that we take for granted, walking. We do it with a fluid grace, a natural, instinctual behavior, and we're, and, and we're used to doing it in video games in the, in the same way, naturally, gracefully, fluidly. So what happens when we make it deliberate, conscious? Well, it's a nightmare, but it's also hilarious, and it's also strangely beautiful. In playing a game like this, 
you become aware of awareness. What, what are my fingers doing? It's like I'm aware of them for the first time. I feel the strands of energy connecting my mind to my fingers. Oh, oh, this is what it feels like to do something. It's, it's so ubiquitous, I'd forgotten what it feels like. I feel the contours of this complicated interactive system, this tiny stylized slice of the world. I, I struggle to develop explicit theories about it. I poke at it with trial and error. And then, slowly, painfully, I build an understanding. And then slowly, it starts to become fluid again. I rebuild a new kind of intuition. And eventually, I'm walking a little bit. <laughs> so here we have nothing but instrumental play. Right? It's just a goal constrained by rules that we are attempting to master through deliberate effort. But playing co-op doesn't feel like a celebration of the cold Apollonian power of deliberate and rational thought. It feels like a parody of rational thought. It feels Dionysian, atavistic, uh, like some primal ritual that takes place in the boiler room of our brain. Co-op is like a microscope that magnifies the hidden operations of our mind as it struggles to think and do. All of the thoughts and emotions that are normally invisible to us because they are the very stuff that we are made out of. It is thought made visible to itself. And this quality of games, their ability to give us a window into how our minds operate, is something that I think you will find over and over again if you pay close attention to what it actually feels like to play a game. And this quality is central to my understanding of what games are. All games, from the most competitive, rule-bound systems to the most anarchic, free-form play spaces. You can feel the same quality of thought made visible to itself when you start solving Sudoku puzzles, or really any kind of puzzle. First, you develop explicit low-level theories, which you consciously apply, like a child mouthing the shapes of letters in order to figure out the words. Then eventually, you internalize these low-level rules. They become second nature. You, uh, you apply them naturally, effortlessly, and you start developing new, higher-level methods, which, again, you apply deliberately and consciously. And then those two become internalized, become automatic, unconscious, natural. And you start developing even, even higher level methods, strategies and heuristics, and so on, up the ladder of expertise. And there's a beauty in Sudoku, beyond the satisfaction of effort and reward, beyond the pleasure of starting with a few threads of data and weaving them into a blanket of knowledge, beyond the comfort of repetitious, deliberate mechanical thinking, the real beauty is in getting an opportunity to glimpse this process of our own minds climbing the ladder, of what it feels like to learn something. It's like squirting dye into the water in order to see the complex currents that flow through it. It is thought made visible to itself. You can feel it when you play a racing game. When you start out, you're pushing the buttons deliberately, consciously, thumping and scraping around the track, seeing the corner come up, you're telling yourself, oh, here comes that corner, get ready to turn. And you go around the track, bumping, shuddering, pressing buttons, your eyes mouthing the shapes of the upcoming turns out loud so that your thumbs can respond. Around and around, and with each lap, something amazing happens. Incrementally, bit by bit, your mind creates new passageways between your eyes and your thumbs. Your eyes dig the grooves of the track deeper and deeper into your memory banks, like a song that starts out as notes on a graph, plucking them out, deliberately, instrumentally, and then becomes a habit, second nature, automatic, and then becomes something more, a part of you. This thing that was out there in the world is now just a part of you that you can do things with. And you can feel it. You can feel it. This thing that happens all the time, now it's happening right in front of your eyes. And you can feel it taking shape in your hands. Things that used to be decisions become actions. Things that used to be actions become nothing. Just you, flying around the track, empty-headed, lighter than air, hovering. Just you and the Chemical Brothers. <laughs> Consider the worst thing that can happen to a baseball pitcher, or any athlete, really, uh, which is to choke. To choke means to become consciously aware of a complex action that should be natural, fluid, effortless, 
all of a sudden you're trying to deliberately move your body in the correct way. Instead of the effortless glide through the moist night air under the stars, instead of that, you have the, the proofs and figures of your arms and legs and they're ranged in columns before you and you're trying to add, divide and measure them and you're stuck in the beginner's mind, too aware of the basic step-by-step -step methods behind the action that you're trying to execute. Or consider the worst thing that can happen to a poker player, which is to go on tilt. Uh, tilting is sort of the opposite of choking in a way. When you tilt, your emotions get the better of you. You become unable to apply simple principles in a conscious, deliberate way. You lose the ability to slow down and think through the basics that you learned when you were a beginner. Your instincts overwhelm you and they prevent you from applying the careful step-by-step -step methods that would prevent disaster. So in a very important way, in addition to being a game about reading the mind of your opponent, poker is a game about reading your own mind. Now, I'm not saying that every game always provides this experience, thought made visible to itself, the ability to become aware of the operation of one's own mind as it interacts with the world. But I am saying that it is the potential of every game. Every game is a chance to have this experience. And this isn't meant to describe some kind of elevated, super intellectual experience. This quality is present even in silly games, in, in stupid games, especially in stupid games. The, the games that we play to blunt the edges of our mind, to silence its incessant chatter, or to get in touch with our primal instincts. These two are a way of our mind spinning around, trying to get a look at itself. This quality is present even in the most self-destructive, manipulative, addictive games. How often have you found yourself dragging the hook of some potentially addictive game across the surface of your brain, seeing if it will catch? This too is a way of mapping out the contours of our minds. All games, abstract or story-based, physical or digital, rule-bound and competitive or open-ended and improvisational, are about thinking and doing. This is what we mean by interactivity, whether it's Sid Meier's interesting choices or Kanega's improvisational free play. Games are the realm of thinking and doing, thought and action, the mind, the will engaging with the world. Thinking and doing is to games what looking is to painting, what listening is to music. In our normal lives, thinking and doing are ubiquitous pervasive and therefore invisible to us. When we decide to get out of bed, when we walk across the room to open the door, when we choose the words that we want to say to a friend, when we get dressed and go to work, we are thinking, doing, choosing, acting, judging, deciding, exploring, learning. But when we do these things in a game, we're doing them for their own sake. And that's what makes games an aesthetic form. When we look at a painting, we surrender to the experience of looking. We immerse ourselves in it. But we're also consciously aware of looking. This thing that we do all the time without thinking about it, we become aware of our own perception of light and color and shape and texture. And when we play a game, we surrender ourselves to the experience of thinking and doing. We immerse ourselves in it. But we're also consciously aware of thinking and doing. This thing that is normally invisible, we become aware of the shape and texture of the operation of our own mind. This is a kind of a double movement. We're plunging forward and immersing ourselves in an experience while also leaning back to frame it, to become aware of it, conscious of it. This is what aesthetic experiences allow us. And games are the aesthetic form of thinking and doing. Interactivity, thought and action, decoupled from actual purpose and experienced for its own sake so that we can indulge ourselves in it, understand it, reflect on its myriad different forms, looking for meaning and beauty. And really, when we talk about thinking and doing, we're basically talking about instrumental reason, not in the negative sense of cold logic and mechanical execution, but in the simple sense that any thinking, doing mind is making plans and acting on them, observing the world, forming hypotheses, making and updating models, learning, pursuing goals, solving problems, interacting with the world around it. When we play games, we do these things for their own sake, as a kind of delirious ritual. Games are the aesthetic form of instrumental reason. Games are interactivity as an art form. They are about choices and consequences, actions and outcomes, about using our minds to learn, understand, and do things. 
an art form whose raw material is instrumental reason, the thing that defines us as humans, the creatures who occupy the cognitive niche. This quality that is invisible to us because it's, it's the stuff that we're made out of. Now, this doesn't mean that games are merely a celebration of instrumental reason. It's far from it. What they are is an opportunity to reflect on instrumental reason, to contemplate it, investigate it. Yes, in games, we often indulge our capacity for instrumental reason. We, we take it off the leash and allow it to run wild, just as we sometimes smother it or invert it. But the main idea is that games are where we think and do for its own sake, just to do it. In games, we build roofs that don't keep out the rain. We search for treasure that can't be spent. We fight enemies that can't harm us. We rescue children that aren't in danger. We solve problems that don't exist. We do these things in pursuit of meaning and beauty because that's what aesthetic forms are. And here's the crux of the matter. Because games are an aesthetic form, that means they are utterly, completely on the right side of the dotted line that we drew earlier. The essential property of aesthetics is that it's not the domain of the logical and the rational. It is the domain of the subjective, the realm of the irreducible. Games can be beautiful or ugly, sublime or ridiculous, entertaining or boring. We can never, ever produce evidence that proves definitively which of these things any particular game is. The realm of the aesthetic is the realm of judgment, taste, pleasure and pain sensation and experience. You can't prove something is beautiful with logic or facts. You can only appeal to shared subjective experience, to try to forge connections of common feeling and establish communities of agreement or useful debate. And that's the job of aesthetics, to be the domain beyond the practical, beyond the logical, to be immeasurable, inexplicable, but at the same time allow this process by which we weave our individual experiences together into something shared, shared values and shared humanity. But look at what kind of aesthetic form they are. They're the aesthetic form of instrumental reason. And this makes them different. This makes them a very different kind of aesthetic form. Because despite being an aesthetic form, games have objective truth in them. And because of this, they belong in a sense on the left side of the dotted line, along with science and logic and evidence and rationality. So, so what do I mean by saying games have objective truth in them? Well, take chess, for example. When you look at a position in chess, some moves are winning moves and some moves are losing moves. And this is simply an objective fact about this position. And in fact, the beauty of chess is in searching for and discovering and debating about this truth. This search for truth, this process of asking questions, what happens when you do this instead of this? Or is this possible? Or does this work? There are versions of this across all games. Games are conversations between players, designers, and the world. The world. The empirical world. The positivist world, the old-fashioned, naturalistic, material world with its stubborn, inert truth, that world is a participant in the conversation. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that this is the same conversation that science is. I'm not trying to reduce games to science or math. Because remember, games are an aesthetic form. This conversation that's happening is about beauty and meaning pleasure and disgust, direct experience leading to shared values. The words of this conversation might include explanation, evidence, logic, proof, but the conversation itself is irreducible, inexplicable, mysterious. For example, in chess, each individual game of chess, each position can be broken down and analyzed with logic, but the act of playing chess Devoting your life to this ridiculous thing, developing the, the, the self-control needed to master this discipline, waking up early every day to study books and, and to drill yourself on this arcane skill, going to tournaments, these elaborate rituals where you test yourself against other people. This isn't logical. It's, it's bonkers. I mean, there may be objective truth in games, but the truths that emerge from games, their ultimate meaning is the other kind of truth. In Ode on a Grecian Urn, the poet John Keats says, beauty is truth, truth 
beauty. And nowhere is this more true, I believe, than in games. This is what puts games in such an interesting position relative to the two cultures, as C.P. Snow called them. When we make and play games, we are actively straddling these two realms, these two domains. And not by picking and choosing between them, but by being wholly absorbed in both simultaneously. By drilling down to the point where they are the same and ascending to the point where you can't tell them apart. Not by using rational thought and technology to deliver beauty and pleasure and meaning. And not by having pretty pictures and compelling stories side by side with or on top of or instead of systems of choices and actions and outcomes, but by being the aesthetic form of choices and actions and outcomes. In games, we pursue thinking and doing for its own sake, which makes them both a violent plunge into the heart of instrumental reason, but also means that they are outside of instrumental reason, a kind of escape that goes not around, but through. Look, I know that it's wrong to say that games are one thing or another thing. Games are whatever we want, I know that. So I guess really what I'm saying is that this is what games are for me. This is how I see them. In my vision, games are about discovering the beauty and pleasure in instrumental reason. Games are laboratories for thought and action. They're a way for thought to become visible to itself. Opportunities to investigate the relationship between the deliberate, the rational, and the intuitive, the instinctual, the subconscious. So often what players are doing is actually a kind of science, a version of the scientific process as play. You see it obviously in any game with theory crafting where players devote themselves to reverse engineering the game systems, using instrumental reason to discover objective facts about the world of the game, or when they're just goofing off. Tank. Load the jump program. Ignoring the ostensible goals of the game and just toying with the physics of the world. This is also an activity that's both playful and scientific. Can you get the warthog to the top of the cliff? I don't know. Can you? Let's find out. Precise hit will set up a chain reaction. The shaft is ray shielded, so you'll have to use proton torpedoes. That's impossible, even for a computer. It's not impossible. I used to bullseye womp rats in my T16 back home. They're not much bigger than two meters. <laughs> I mean, this is someone. Ignoring the rules of the game, right? This is someone appropriating the game to do something that's totally orthogonal to what you're supposed to do. And yet it's like a, it's like a pure form of, of, of instrumental reason run wild. Um, another example of uh, play science that I love is when players are taking a game super seriously. Uh, trying to discover what it would mean to pursue the goal of the game as hard as you can, as, as they do in speedrunning. One of the things I love so much about uh, Half-Life speedruns is that uh, the game of Half-Life is, is a game on its surface which is about scientists discovering hidden truths about physics and using that knowledge to warp space and time. When players speedrun Half-Life, they are actual scientists discovering actual hidden truths about the actual world of Half-Life and using that knowledge to actually warp space and time. It's so beautiful about that. And it happens in Zelda, too. It's real magic. In Zelda, when you see someone use a chicken to, like, open up a gate under, you know what I mean, through space-time, under a well, it's real magic. That's what magic actually is. Um, and you see play science 
in any deep competitive game, obviously, right? The fighting game community in particular is defined by this intense communal ongoing process of analyzing and reverse engineering, theory building and experimentation. Uh, when they discover a new move or uh, a new corner in the game's combination space, they call it new tech. High-level competitive gamers are a strange mix of athlete, scientist, and artist. But you also see it in the least serious, least competitive games. For example, in the simple trial and error of an Angry Birds player. And I think that this spirit is present even in the most anti-system, anti-goal, anti-problem-solving twine games of the Zinster Underground. Yes, these games are often about expressing a personal story. Do you know what else they're about? They're about encoding your personal story as software. And they're also about insisting that we break down the division between player and creator, about insisting absolutely correctly on the importance of players becoming creators, uh, learning how to navigate the logic gates and symbolic operations of twine in which, unlike poems or paintings, your story can simply work or not work, can be broken in a way that is simply, objectively, beautifully true. I think this is one of the main reasons that making games is so difficult. Making games combines everything that's hard about building a bridge and everything that's hard about composing an opera. Games are basically operas made out of bridges. <laughs> games can be broken in ways that are simply objectively true, and, and not just at the level of code, but at the level of design. You, you can say, oh, this choice here is dominated by this one. It's never useful, never makes sense. It's a, it's a weird way to design, but we recognize this sensation, right? This strange form of design that has a lot of engineering in it. Not just at the level of technique, but in its deepest, most creative dimensions. Or maybe it's not so strange. Maybe it's just something that we forgot a long time ago, and we're only now remembering. Maybe what's strange is treating bridge building and opera composing like they're totally separate specializations that shouldn't overlap. But you know, this mix of the objective and the subjective in games is hard to navigate, and it leads to a lot of strange detours, like academic white papers that seem to miss the fact that games are culture and instead treat them as some kind of special technology, a certain type of simulated environment. So here's a quote from this paper, for example. Video games provide virtual environments in which opportunities for action are manifold. The growth of participation in these environments suggests that they can be highly motivating. Though little empirical research has explained this phenomenon or accounted for why some games are more popular than others. <laughs> oh, good luck with that, guys. Good luck explaining frog fractions with that framework. Or Flappy Bird. Right? Or explaining the, the subtle difference between Dishonored and Bioshock Infinite. Game studies and, and honestly even game design discourse is really filled with overly systematic attempts to model player experience in order to make definitive empirical claims about how pleasure works. Which to me drastically misrepresents the endlessly subtle and slippery and elusive qualities of aesthetics. The qualities that, say, distinguish Super Mario World from Braid. You will never see these things under a microscope. Games are not things that you can put under a microscope. Games are microscopes. Games have microscopes in them. Here's another place where we see the struggle between bridge building and opera composing, the dilemma of quantitative data-driven game design. So many of us have probably struggled with this tension directly. Many of us are probably struggling with it right now. So what's wrong with this stuff? Like, why isn't this just an extension of player-centric, playtesting-centric, humanist game design? I think, so here's an analogy that I like to, to tell about this tension. Um, imagine that you have a friend who's a guy, and he has trouble meeting women and forming relationships with women. And he tells you, I don't know what I'm doing wrong. I, I go on a date, and I bring a, a thermometer so that I can measure their skin temperature. Um, I bring uh, calipers so I can measure their pupil to see when it's expanding and contracting, and I pay close attention to their reactions to the things I say, but somehow it just, just never seems to work out. It, the point is that it, it doesn't even matter if these are the correct things to measure, if you were trying to predict someone's sexual arousal. If you bring a thermometer and calipers with you on a date, you're not going to be having sex. So all of these things, I think, point to a 
kind of a central dilemma about rationality itself, that it must have an outside. Because there's really only one important question worth asking, which is, what is a life well lived? How should we live our lives? And that's a question that can't be answered, not by me, probably not by anyone ever, but one thing we can say with a lot of certainty, that a life well lived is not going to be a life in which every moment is scrutinized to see whether or not it's being well lived. You know, this is a central dilemma. This is an important, weird, hard, non-trivial problem that's related maybe in some ways to like Godelian incompleteness. We also need to acknowledge, I think, as a field, as an entire field, that we have a kind of style problem. <laughs> right? I mean, games are an aesthetic form, but we have so much less of all those qualities on the right side of the chart than we would like to have. We are less subtle and sensitive. We are less suave and charismatic. We tend to be blunt and awkward. We are less charming and smooth. And this is a way of describing a general lack with our games. But it also describes a general characteristic of a lot of us as people. A lot of game creators and a lot of game players. And I think we need to address this honestly. I mean, there are two things I want to say about this. First, I think we need to embrace cognitive diversity. There are different personality types. And we need to recognize that being an art form for the awkward, for the obsessive, for folks on the spectrum, as they say, it's nothing to be ashamed of. I mean, this is the personality type of, of scientists, mathematicians, engineers, and, and many philosophers. And also, like, so often, suave sophistication and charm and charisma is camouflage for manipulation. Fuck that! Let's be proud of the fact that we are bringing more logic and precision into the world. That we care more about equations than haircuts. That's something to celebrate. And yet, let's be honest. And this is the second thing. Let's be honest that we do care about haircuts. That we are embarrassed by our lack of style and charm and grace. We're embarrassed that our art form is still very dorky and awkward. Let's just admit it and work on it. Let's say that we want both. We want equations and haircuts. And we really do. And it's right to want both. That's just acknowledging this fact. The fact that what we are doing is about beauty. Even when it is the beauty of logic and math, among other things. And that we recognize the importance of all those qualities on the right side of the slide. And we want more of them. This is a picture of Mewtwo King, who's one of the best Smash Brothers players in the world. And, um, this is a shot from the documentary The Smash Brothers, which you should see if you haven't seen it. It's on YouTube. Maybe one of the best films uh, about uh, a game ever made. The Smash Brothers on uh, YouTube. So one more example of the tension between bridge building and opera composing. The story of progress that we tell ourselves about video games that they are evolving kind of the way technology evolves or the way science evolves. Now, I'm guilty of telling this story myself. What are the unsolved problems of game design? What experiments should we run? What new knowledge can we gain to move us incrementally forward? This is a picture of David Hilbert, the mathematician, who in 1900 introduced this list of unsolved problems that really set the course of mathematical research in the 20th century. And he's a romantic figure for me. I would love to be able to stand up here and say, you know, here's my vision for the 23 most important unsolved problems in game design. And obviously, there, there's a lot of value in this approach of problems and progress, but there's also a sense in which this way of framing games, again, misses the elusive and messy and chaotic way that aesthetics operates. Sure, there are some aspects of art forms that develop over time, techniques that are discovered and perfected and adopted, but there are many more ways in which art forms don't develop that way. Cave paintings can still move us. Keats can look at a vase from 2,000 years ago, from 2,000 years before he was born, and find beauty and meaning in it. In some ways, we are inheriting the legacy of 20th century modernism, which was itself, I think, kind of bedazzled by science, the science that it saw so successfully transforming the world around it. 
wanted a piece of that. And so I think it framed aesthetics in scientific terms. Experiments, breakthroughs, discoveries, and unsolved problems. And this approach is even more seductive for us because of how much science and engineering there is in games, both in their creation and in their play. But I think we need to be careful of this approach. Art is not a series of engineering problems, and neither is games. The destiny of games is not to evolve the way that technology evolves, but to evolve alongside technology as a counterpoint, a partner, a kind of dark companion. This is how games are in a position to overcome the two cultures problem, the gap between Whitman people and Feynman people. This isn't just a conflict between the sciences and the humanities. We don't just work in an industry that is defined by this tension. We live in a world that is defined by this tension. We live in a world that has been utterly transformed by instrumental reason. The Enlightenment, the Industrial Revolution, science, these things have taken us into new territory. The power of rational thought is undeniable, but so are its costs. Our world is shot through with the trade-offs we make in order to access this power. Not just the obvious ones, like the looming danger of nuclear or environmental apocalypse, but the psychic trade-offs of living in a world where in many, game, in many ways the rug has been pulled out from under us. We used to live lives that were grounded in a deep, organic, intuitive, emotional sense of connection to nature, to tradition, to society. It wasn't necessarily good. In fact, it was often horrific, but it had a lot of good things about it. And a lot of those things are missing. We no longer feel like we're a part of the natural world. We feel like we're outside of it, studying it, inspecting it, manipulating it. We no longer feel like we're in a well-defined and comfortable position within a social hierarchy. We also feel like we're in a tumultuous and upended and constantly changing uh, social environment as well. And all of the comfort and security that comes from relying on the deep knowledge of tradition and instinct, unquestioned, all of that has been replaced by a tumultuous upheaval in which everything is up for grabs. All that is solid melts into air, as Marx put it. Everything is subject to doubt, Feynman's doubt, the doubt of Feynman's father, the doubt of the scientist. Nothing is sacred, nothing is off limits, safe from being scrutinized by instrumental reason, explained, disenchanted, dismantled, reassembled into something new and strange that doesn't even feel like it quite belongs to us. But it does belong to us. This struggle to harness the power of instrumental reason, to understand its power and limits, to guide it, this is our struggle. We aren't going to be able to go around it. We have to go through it. Every big problem in the world today is a mixture of, on the one hand, the empirical, the factual, the logistical, and on the other, values. Every important problem is a blend of engineering problems, math problems, and values problems. Instrumental reason is really good at solving engineering problems, but it can't help us with values problems. The scientific method doesn't tell us why the world is decomposable into coherent units subject to consistent laws. It just tells us that if we act as if it were that way, then we can fly through the air like birds and walk around on the moon and save little babies from dying. It doesn't tell us how we should use this power, where we should go with it, or honestly, whether we should use it at all. It's, this is a higher order problem. And this is a very important problem, especially if, like me, you see the Enlightenment project as something profound and worthwhile, an important positive direction for humanity, something that is still underway and something whose success is not a foregone conclusion, a project that could fail in all kinds of terrible ways, and therefore a project worth understanding, critiquing, and getting right. After all, whatever your opinion is about flying through the air like a bird or walking around on the moon, it's hard to argue with preventing babies from dying. I mean, that's a pretty strong trump card. Art is a window in to these kinds of problems. Problems where we have to communally bootstrap ourselves into shared values. 
And games are the art form with the most to tell us about this particular problem. Games are the art form of instrumental reason. Games are where we put down our slide rules for a moment, where we put down our computers and hammers and rocket ships, our amazing math and our glorious opposable thumbs, in order to examine them, reflect on them, enjoy them for their own sake, wonder about them, argue about them, ask what about them is beautiful, and what about them is ugly? As game designers, it's our responsibility to think about this stuff. We should be proud of this responsibility and a little scared about it. Our art for art form could lead to new ways of thinking through the central dilemmas of the modern world. This doesn't tell us what kind of games to make, but it does remind us to avoid simplifications and respect the complexity of the challenge. We are a new kind of scientists who are also athletes and artists, and we should think about how what we do fits into this bigger picture of a possible world where something like that makes sense, where the power of instrumental reason unfolds in harmony with the beauty of shared values. Yeah, I know, it's a romantic picture, but romantic pictures have a place. Before Bennett Foddy joined me at uh, NYU, he was at Oxford, uh, down the hall from this guy, the great contemporary philosopher Derek Parfit. Uh, Parfit's project is to build a system of morality outside the context of metaphysics, one that doesn't rely on transcendental religious ideas. This is, in its bigger, more serious way, a kind of quap of the human soul. In a world where we no longer have the certainty of big religious truths, where all we have is our doubts, our intuitions, trial and error, thought and action, the modest workaday tools of boring empiricism, can we rebuild a new understanding of where we are going and how to get there? Can we relearn how to walk? And if you read Parfit, it really is like watching someone play quap. It's a series of tentative steps, slow, awkward, swaying back and forth, deliberate, self-conscious, taking nothing for granted, but slowly finding a rhythm, moving forward step by ridiculous step. And I can't think of a more important project in the world. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. I think we have, thank you, um, thanks. Um, I think there's time for some questions, if there are any, uh, if there are any questions, I would love to um, converse, I believe, in dialogue, <laughs> and I just stood up here and gave a long speech, so I would love nothing more than to uh, answer any questions, if there are any, um, there don't have to be questions, but there are always questions, right? What is a life well lived? Yes, please. Sure, uh, hit the mic. Awesome talk. Thank, Thank you. you. That was great. Thanks. Um, I just, I wanted to know what your opinion is on, I'm new to gaming, and a lot of what I've encountered is this idea of very difficult individuals demanding to be left alone inside their medium. It's like, I'm a gamer. This is a thing I do. Asperger's, all kinds of things and barriers that we put up and I think that limits the conversation with yeah with the rest <laughs> yeah I mean I think without a doubt one of the main problems with games is that it is weirdly isolated from the rest of the world in a way sometimes it's cut off in its own little hermetic uh, environment its own little nation with its own customs and and um, I think it's an important project to try to find points of connection uh, with the rest of the world ways of um, resonating with the rest of the world, with other um, kinds of art and design and culture, um, with uh, important themes and issues uh, that were, you know, political issues or big ideas that we're struggling with. Um, I think I think that's that's important, um, and uh, and it's something that I I'm yeah a, a big uh, fan of. So, yeah. Um, yes. 
A wonderful talk. Thank I, you. I, I, frankly, just completely worth it, even for that that simple uh, story about the the dating. You know, that that's just yeah. uh, I'm going <laughs> to quote that many times. One of the things, though, that hit me that I'm, I'm curious about your opinion about is the the dichotomy that you see. Um, one of the areas where that uh, you, you brought into relief uh, how I feel about serious games sometimes, because uh, a game that was meant for pure play and in, in, in the sense you describe that is suddenly applied as, as like a brain training game, sometimes it can yeah. suck all the fun out of it. But conversely, sometimes a game that I feel uh, guilty about playing because I know there's nothing more to explore, I'm not really getting that, that joy, but it keeps me busy while I'm on the exercise bike and I feel good that it's helping me with a physical you know, a problem. Yeah. It, it seems like there's some, some interesting extra layer that comes on when you consider serious games that, yeah. that's very fundamental. That, I mean, that, so I, I, I think that my approach, so this, this framework for thinking about games is the aesthetics of instrumental reason sort of explains why I am uncomfortable with serious games. It's another way of getting at that problem of, of serious games, because to me, serious games are... Um, they're, they're, like a, they're, they're like a double, they're like a double uh, abstraction, right? Because in games, um, we, uh, you know, we, we sort of experience tool use, right, uh, for its own sake. So we take the pliers and we just like swing the pliers around and we, or we figure out like how, how many nuts could I possibly, you know, uh, attach in, in one minute exactly. And then because of that, we like invent new kinds of pliers just, but we're not like, if you then are doing that in order to build a ship, then it's, you're missing like, like that just doesn't work. Right. Because the essence of what you're doing is that it's, it's a kind of, you're, you're taking something that actually has a, a function and use, right? The ability to think and solve problems and do things. Um, and you're kind of like c carving out a little space where you do it for its own sake, which is just kind of a, it's kind of madness. It's ridiculous. And then you can't then ex try to apply that um, itself as a, as a deliberate tool. I think, that's, I think that's part of the problem. I think that you have to just go into that, that crazy mad realm and then you come out of it, and hopefully you've you've become like you, your life has been enriched in some ways. Whether you become a better shipbuilder or whatever, like you, but you can't. Um, yeah, I don't. I don't think you can. I think you drain out everything that's important um, if you if you try to take the uh, you know the the plier game and and and, t and build an actual ship with it. To to put it in, in specific terms, then, like, if, if someone were simply playing Civilization and, as part of that process, learn something about the process of history, that's the, the proper way. If you go to a class and they, they try and teach it through Civilization and kind of suck all of the enjoyment and abstraction out of the game and, and throw into relief all the game-like things of Abraham Lincoln living for 4,000 years. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. And there's no question that you can use games like that just in the same way that you can use music to memorize the alphabet. We all do it. There's nothing wrong with it. But it's not the main thing that we like about music. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much for such a transcendent talk, Thanks. Frank. Um, so I uh, have kind of noticed this year at GDC some kind of theme emerging around sort of um, embodied play and sort of performance. And mm, uh, I loved all of your great examples. They seem to focus quite a lot on more highly structured play. Mm -hmm. Um, do you have any thoughts about particular uh, avenues of interest for maybe less structured, more open kinds of play that would come at things. Yeah, I mean, I guess in, in some ways um, this whole thing is, is my attempt to, to um, uh, celebrate this, this, this other form of play and explain what's, uh, what I find profound and meaningful about it. Uh, but it's in no way meant to exclude uh, other kinds of play. Um, I, in some ways this is a response to people like David Kanega and Miguel Seacard, uh, Doug Wilson and, and these other people who I think are putting, are, are putting forward a really articulate and powerful um, celebration of uh, a kind of critique of, 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 this, of this other kind of more structured play. And 
Um, I, I just want both, right? I, I don't, I don't want, and I think that, that most of, most of the time, the, those people, um, are, uh, are, are open-minded, and they're, they're saying, oh, listen, that stuff is good, too. But they, secretly, I don't think they think it's good. I think they think it's bad. I think the Tale of Tales people are, are one of the things I love about them so much is how honest they are about, like, no, that's, that's actually bad. You know, it's, like, bad. And I, I, I guess what I'm saying is that it's not, and I'm, but it's, it's forcing me to try to figure out why it's not bad. And, and this is one answer. And not only is it, is it not bad, but it's, like, not bad in a way that I want to share with them. I want them, I want to convince them. It's not enough for me to say, oh, well, you play your games and I'll play mine. Um, I want to be playing games with them, and I want to play their games, and I, but I also want them to understand uh, that, that there is a, there's something that, there's, there, there's a shared values, that, that, you know what I mean? I want to reinforce the, the, the things that I think that um, we, where we could agree about these, these other kinds of games and kind of maybe, um, you know, rescue them from, from that critique. Successfully. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Let me go this way. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I was really interested by um, your talk, um, but um, at the same time, it sort of reminds me of a lot of experiences I've had. I've done uh, serious games and also um, sort of been an observer of sort of the trends and sort of you know sort of artistic games and things exploring the sort of aesthetic space you're describing there. And one thing I see is sort of a tension, I guess, between these attempts to push more of sort of an aesthetic sort of sensibilities into games is that you end up with uh, both on the, the developer side and the player side sort of people that fall into two camps, people that sort of hear things like what you're saying and either fully embrace them, they really like it, so they end up sort of going in a direction where they try to make games that either maybe convert people who don't normally play games into playing games or um, make something that's unconventional that while is admirable in its pursuit maybe doesn't quite fly with, you know, uh, traditional gamers. Yeah. And then on the other side, you have people that totally reject it, that think, oh, this is just all platitudes and just highfalutin talk and just sort of and just sort of reject it and just go back to making, you know, just mindless shooters and stuff. And I feel like um, I'm... For me, I, I think it would be. Um, I feel like there's a lot. More, we need a lot more effort to try to blend those more. Mm -hmm. To try to find well, some, add more yeah. substance to our traditional games and add more. Yeah. You know, this is this is in no yeah. way meant to be like an admonition to make certain kinds of games or not make other kinds of games. I think people should make the game that they want to make. Make the game they want to play. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so yeah, it's more just maybe a, 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 an attempt to kind of like hint at what's going on here and, and what, what we could like look for, you know, as, as part of the, the purpose and meaning or the, in a larger sense uh, behind what, what, whatever, both of these kinds of games that are being made, all of these different kinds of games. Um, I think we have time for one more, one more question. One more question. All right. Hi. Uh, very inspiring talk. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, but... Uh... With gaming, I feel, becoming more ubiquitous now, um, with the advent of mobile gaming being very accessible, uh, you're seeing uh, game development schools popping up, you know, the rise of esports and similar avenues of popularizing games and just how we feel. Like, a lot of the stuff really speaks to us within these halls, you know, we're all game developers, but do you feel that this is almost, we're starting to see a sort of a renaissance where gamings are, gaming is becoming uh, accepted as an art form and that this kind of a talk would resonate with people outside of you know, I our hope circles. So. Yes, I hope so. That would be my hope. I would love for, uh, to, to, to reach a, a broader audience and have this larger conversation about what's going on with, with games and, and why there's more happening there than, than uh, maybe it looks and, and how this could, uh, uh, you know, I don't know. Maybe, maybe I, I would love for there to be, for, for us as game developers, to own this thing that we're doing, we're changing the world, and step, our, step up our game, be, like become public intellectuals. I think there's, you know what I mean? Like have an opportunity like, to bring this idea that living with games, making them and playing them, should make us smart, good, interesting people. And let's you know, exhibit that um, in the way that we, that we talk to the rest of the world and, and carry ourselves in the rest of the world. And, and this is kind of my... Um, battle cry to, to do that, right? To, to have a kind of uh, seriousness with which we say, no, this is, 
what it, like the, the way filmmakers do, right? They understand the seriousness of, of what film. Film is the, the kind of global id of the of the, 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 the 20th century, right? It is this. It's the shared imagination of the entire world, and they take it seriously. Well, what is it that we're doing? And that's that's the question I want to ask, and and I want to just take that seriously. I want us all to take that seriously. Yeah. Thanks.